So, have you ever had that annoying dilemma where you can't work out what film to watch? Maybe you've seen too many films or ran out of options. Or maybe you're feeling experimental. Well, fear not, my friend. Here's a list of films you need to watch before you die. Now, this isn't a list of the best films ever. Instead, this is a list of the more obscure films or less known films that are either underrated or little spoken of. Your underrated champs, if you like. So let's do this, starting with number 10. This list will be in order of importance and greatness. High Noon. Now, we're starting off this list with a slightly more known film. Now, there are a couple of things that are guaranteed in movies. One is Christopher Nolan films will always have an indecipherable dialogue. Someone in the arms tray, we'll be training. And the other is that a classic film that was once considered an epic will kind of fade into the annals of history. Somehow it gets lost in time. And it feels like High Noon is one of those films. I remember it once being referred to as one of the greatest Hollywood films. This Western classic is an excellent film that kind of plays against the grain. Firstly, it's an anti-Western of sorts. Marshall Will Kane, played by the excellent Gary Cooper, is told that the outlaw Frank Miller will arrive in town at noon and will attempt to kill him. A lot, Kane, considering the kind of man Frank Miller is. We all know what Miller's like. That's why I'm here. His newly wedded wife, Amy, played by the stunning Grace Kelly, they don't make them like that anymore, is religious and believes the best solution is to leave town. You don't have to be a hero, not for me. But the Marshal, who isn't religious, believes that staying and fighting for the honour of the badge and justice is the best route forward. So already we can see there's a conflict. Religion versus man, pacifism versus violence. Now, the film isn't the most beautifully shot film. It looks good, but it's not the most beautifully shot film, nor is the acting the best you've ever seen. Each actor knows the role they have to play, and they play it perfectly. And the direction serves the purpose of pushing the story forward. The triumph of the film is that it has a tremendously tight script with a powerful message, which is executed to a T. It's one of the best westerns made and really stands strong as a dramatic piece as well. So let's get this straight. Director Gaspar Noé is batshit crazy. He's often lauded by many, including myself, as being a visionary. But the criticism he always gets is that his work is style over substance. He's the guy who does this in his title sequences. And Climax is no different. It's all style and very little substance, or no message. But my God, it has a ton of fun doing it. The lead actress in this film is the wonderful Sofia Butella, an actress Hollywood has tried and failed for many years to turn into a lead. And it's a real shame because she has enormous talent and great screen presence. And this is her best performance as a dancer in Paris who is part of a dance troupe. During a party at an abandoned school, someone spikes their drinks with LSD. And then for about one hour of the 19 minute runtime, we are subjected to the most anxiety inducing horror film I've ever seen. As Noé is famous for, the camera floats, dances, glides, twists, turns and doesn't stop moving, whilst the dancers all savagely destroy each other. Now, it may feel like I've said way too much about this film, maybe giving away the whole story, but honestly, there is no story. This film is one that has to be experienced. You'll be gripping onto your seat for 60 minutes, guaranteed. What 
exactly are you talking about? I'm talking about nuclear fucking war. Who is this? Number eight, Miracle Mile. The second of not many American films on this list is a hidden gem. Long story short, a couple immediately fall in love after a chance encounter. In lieu of a second meeting, he is told that there will be a nuclear explosion in 17 minutes. And he races off to be reunited with his new love before the explosion goes off. You know, sometimes there are films that really have no major stars or any brilliant practical or computer generated effects, and they just hit the spot. This film is one of those. This 80s cult classic again succeeds due to a tight script, good acting, and a wonderful ending that will stick with you way after the credit roll. But the true magic in this film, and in all the films on this list, is that it knows exactly what it wants to be and it knows how to get there. If you're looking to be entertained for 87 minutes and left thinking, what would I do in that situation? Then this is the ideal film for you. <laughs> Seven, One Cut of the Dead. It's hard to believe that this film was made for just $75,000. It's a testament to, again, a tight script. This Japanese horror film is a low budget horror film about a low budget horror film being made. So essentially what we have here is a film within a film that eventually becomes a film outside the film. Now, if that sounds confusing, it's not that confusing. Once you see it, you'll know exactly what's going on. And you will see it. Much like the other films on this list so far, bar climax, the film doesn't look particularly stunning. It's well shot and it's well acted. And it knows what it wants to be. I know at this point you're probably thinking this guy's just saying the same thing over and over again about the same films. And maybe in a way, what I'm doing here is striking home a point about how you successfully make a good film. But also, with this film, that is just the case. The director writer knew his budget works within the confines of that and creates a funny, self-referential film that successfully manages to raise itself beyond its low-budget roots. The greatest compliment I can pay this film is that 97 minutes feels like 45. It's a really underrated Japanese treat. Number six, The Sea Inside. For me, this spot was a toss-up between this film and The Diving Bell and The Butterfly. Both films are very similar. They both feature a protagonist who is bedbound and unable to move. Both are true stories, and both came out within a three-year span of each other. The reason I chose this film ahead of Diving Bell is that upon my initial research, I noticed that this film doesn't have much information about it online. Barely any clips, nor any real hype behind it. Which is shocking. It actually won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. And Diving Bell has a lot of hype, a lot of clips, information about it online, but no Oscar. And I do personally prefer Diving Bell and the Butterfly, but not by too much. Both are stellar films. The colossal performance of Javier Bardem, who at this point was considered one of the best actors in the world, and really even now is also considered one of the best actors in the world, is more than enough reason to watch this film. His transformation from Spanish 20-something hunk to bedbound, bitter, middle-aged man is quite something. It truly is one of the greatest screen performances. And for a film that is mainly set around a bedbound man, it's the best shot film on the list so far. Chilean director Alejandro Hemibar is an underrated gem. His other great films are Open Your Eyes, starring Penelope Cruz, and the others starring Nicole Kidman. In fact, Open Your Eyes is the original film of which the horrible Vanilla Sky is based on. The Sea Inside is a heartbreaking film that is testament to a director and actor on the top of their game. Number five, Kesha. Hidden, as it's known in English, is apparently a neo-noir thriller, according to Wikipedia. But make no mistake, this is a highly tense drama. Any film that starts like this, an unbroken shot for two minutes straight, is going to be a film full of bold filmmaking. And when I use the term bold filmmaking, Michael Haneke is the director I think of instantly. It stars the always incredible Juliette Binoche in a role which is very much the supporting character to our lead George. Both are being psychologically harassed by a stranger who happens to leave a videotape of this exact shot of their house in their house. The film follows the couple as they try to investigate exactly what is happening. And by doing so, secrets and lies are unraveled. The film has plenty of allegories 
and political messages, as per all French films. And whilst this isn't Haneke's best film, it's certainly in his top three, it's a masterful piece of filmmaking that doesn't rely on music, special effects, elaborate camera movements, nor overacting to hammer home its points. And shows you exactly why Michael Haneke is one of the top 10 best directors of all time. Mon confiance? Moi, je dois te faire confiance? Mais pourquoi pas l'inverse pour une fois? So far, there's two American films on this list, and this is the third French film. Now, there's a fair chance you've heard of this film and maybe not seen it. Or maybe you've seen the lead actor in this. What do you want from me? Hopefully not, for your sake. Because Taha Rahim is a wonderful actor and this film is pure toilet water. This film by the master director, Jack Hordia, is like watching The Godfather, but in prison. The rise and rise of a young French Arab man from absolutely nothing to kingpin is dazzling. The filmmaking is exquisite and like I said before, it's a French film. So there's plenty of allegories and political messages hidden throughout. This was the film that really brought the director to the fore and is his masterpiece. And the performance of Rahim is one of the greatest screen performances of all time. This is not us, this is, this is, this is, this is a half dream. It's a dream, Tommy, I'm praying to you. I can't die. I can't die. I need the wood. Like a dumb animal. In the woods like a dumb animal. Like a, like a, like a dumb animal. I can't die. I can't. I can't die out here in the woods. Like a dumb animal. I can't die. I'm praying to you. Look at your heart. I'm praying to you. Number three, Miller's Crossing. The Coen brothers are not just one known, but also amongst the 10 best directors of all time. Their work is oozing with individual style and quality that is unmistakable. No matter who the DOP or the cast is, you can always tell it's a Coen Brothers film. Miller's Crossing was a film they made in the early 90s, just before they blew up after the film Fargo came out. And honestly, the cinematography here is gorgeous. Barry Sonnenfeld, the DOP, also went on to have a magnificent directorial career in the 90s, and it really shows here. And by a stroke of fate, it allowed the Coen Brothers to start working with Roger Deakins, but that's another story altogether. Miller's Crossing stars the wonderful Gabriel Byrne, Albert Finney and John Turturro. And so far on this list, it has the best cast pound for pound. And the dialogue in this film is poetry worthy of Shakespeare himself. I'm sick of taking a strap from you, Leo. And I'm sick of a high hat. It's crackling off the page and oozing with style. Such fantastic filmmaking should be studied by all upcoming filmmakers. They do not put a foot wrong here. Wow, wow, wow. This film is mag. Magnificent. Now don't get me wrong, this isn't their best film, but this might be my favourite film of theirs and the most that I've revisited. Number two, our second Japanese film, Tokyo Story, is undoubtedly one of the greatest films ever made. I put off watching this film for ages. My thinking was, it's maybe one of those classics that they always say are classics and then you watch them and they're not actually classics. I was so wrong. This film is one of the greatest films I've ever seen. Director Ozo takes you on a simple journey of family, growing old and all the things we take for granted. It's a beautifully shot tale about growing old and the passing of time. And this scene is truly one of the greatest scenes in cinema history.
だんだんそうなるのよじゃあお姉さんもええ泣いたかないけどやっぱりそうなってくわよいやね世の中ってそう嫌なことばっかり I might break down this scene in a separate video. If you're interested, let me know in the comments. And at number one sits what I consider to be the greatest Korean film ever made. Memories of Murder. Let me take you back to five months ago when I first started my YouTube channel. I was a little wet behind the ears. And I made a video about Parasite and said it was nothing compared to Memories of murder. That unfortunately awoke the Parasite stands who all came out in their flocks into the comment section and were not happy at all. But I stick by my video. Punjo Ho's best film is Memories of Murder by some distance. It's hard to believe this was only the director's second film. It is masterful. We see character development, wonderful camera work, beautiful framing, masterful acting, and what the director does best and what most directors fail to do is that he makes you angry, laugh, cry and sad all in the space of just one film. That's a mark of a truly great film. One that can make you happy one minute, sad the next, cry the next, etc, etc, etc. A film that only has one tone to it will never be considered to be one of the best films ever. You need to really hit all the emotions with your viewers. Now think of your favourite film. Think about what it does for you. It makes you laugh, cry, happy, sad. And what a film really has to do, best of all, is you leave your audience wondering what happens next. Now, honestly, I could have named a hundred more films on this list, but I'll save them for the next time. There's probably a few films on this list that you've seen before. Do you think they should be on this list? And have you seen all the films on this list? If you've seen all the films on this list, let me know in the comments. I'm curious to know. If you haven't subbed yet, please do. I'm loving my subscribers. You guys are incredible. Please like the video. Please leave a comment. Please share. As always, there's videos over here. You guys are the best. Until we speak again, big love.